In a previous video, we talked about using the disk management tool to manage volumes and drives. Now let's talk about how to use the same disk management tool to add new drives and then create uh, volumes or partitions. So I'm going to go back to my disk management tool. So I'm going to start for or search for disk management. And what I want is this create and format disk partitions. And when you search just disk is enough to get you there. So here's my disk management tool. And it's going to see that I've added three new disks to my system. Now, this is a virtual machine, so I just added in, went to my virtual machine settings, added three more virtual disks. If this were a physical computer, if it's got hot swappable drives, then I'd just put in hot swappable drives. If not, I'd have to shut the thing down, add in the new drives, power the thing back up. So disk management, when it comes up, recognizes that it it recognizes that it doesn't recognize these disks. It says, hey, these disks have not been initialized yet. They need to be initialized before I can use them. And so I can choose which ones to initialize. I'm going to go ahead and do all three of them. Now, the other thing here is I can do this as MBR or GPT. Now, GPT is newer. It's not supported on all operating systems, which is not necessarily a problem if you're not going to take a drive out of here and put it into a older op uh, device with an older operating system. However, you can have MBR and GPT disks in the same system, but you can't mirror between devices, between disks that are formatted MBR and disks that are formatted GPT, or that are partitioned with MBR and GPT. So since I already have an MBR disk, just for consistency's sake, I'm going to go ahead and use MBR. So I'm going to hit OK, and that will initialize all three of my disks. And then here you're going to see all three of our disks. Now you'll also notice that I made all three of these disks different sizes. So I have a 50 gigabyte, a 60 gigabyte, and a 40 gigabyte. That'll come into play because some of the volumes we create, um, if we use a volume that spans multiple disks, some of them require to use the same amount of space on every disk, some of them don't. Let's start with doing a simple volume though. So here on disk one, I'm going to right click and I'm going to create a new simple volume. And this is just going to be a standard volume. So pretty straightforward. I can set the size of it and I'm going to set my size at, let me turn on number lock here, 40,000 or you know, 40 gigabytes. So 40,000 megabytes, 4 gigabytes. Assign it to the following drive letter, E, that's fine. Now I can also choose not to assign a drive letter. I can just add one later on. I also have this option here to mount into an NPNTFS folder. Now this is not something we do on Windows very often. It's something that you do all the time in Linux-based systems, however. So what, what we would do is, let's say we were running out of space on the C drive and we needed to add in more space to the C drive, but we didn't want to add in an additional drive. Let's say we had data on a database or something like that, that we needed to be on the C drive. What we can do is we can create an empty folder. So just create a folder, NTFS folder, on the C drive, and then we could mount this drive into it. And what would happen is whenever you'd go into that folder, on the C drive, it would actually start saving data to the other physical drive, even though it still shows up as only one drive letter. That's what mounting to an MD NTFS folder does. In this case, I'm okay with assigning a drive letter, so I'm just going to click Next. Now, I can choose to format or not format. I can choose the file system, either EXFAT or NTFS, and this is going to kind of depend your options are going to depend on what you're creating. So you may not have EXFAT as an option. NTFS is probably the one we want to use anyway because that's what gives us compression and security. So I'm going to set the volume label, and this is just going to be a simple volume, so I'm going to call it simple. And then I can choose to add file and folder compression on the entire volume. I can also do it on a specific folder. We'll look at that in another video later on. But if I want to do it on the entire volume, I can enable it here right when I create the volume. Now the last option, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to leave that unchecked for the moment. But my last option here is to perform a quick format. Now I can, if I uncheck that, it will perform a full format. If I check that, it will perform a quick format. Now a quick format obviously is going to be a lot faster. Basically a quick format just formats the partition table, or not the partition table, the uh, file system header. If I do a 
full format, it's going to format every sector on the entire drive. It's going to take a lot longer. And that used to be a big issue when we had older drives. It's not nearly as big of an issue now. So performing a quick format should be just fine. So I'm going to click Next and Finish. And that's going to create a partition for me. All right, nice, fast, autoplay comes up. We're going to tell it to go away. We don't care. Okay, now I want to draw your attention to something here. You see we have this blue band here, this black band here. Well, if we look down here, this is going to show us a legend. So unallocated, or black means it's an allocated space. Blue means it's a primary partition. Let me try to, now I've got a primary partition in place. I can right click, and I can choose to extend or shrink the volume. So let me go ahead and extend the volume, and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So, I'm going to extend the volume, and I'm just going to extend it onto the same disk. And I've got another 11,000 megabytes. I'm going to do 5,000 more. Then I'm going to extend it. And I'm going to click Next and Finish. And so it's going to extend that volume for me. You see now I'm at 43.95 gigabytes. If I have free space on the volume, and this gets a little tricky sometimes, because sometimes it has to do with where the data is stored in the volume. So if I have data written out to, let's say, this point here on the volume, then I could shrink it. But if I had data written all the way out here, even if I have blank space in here that's not written, say I added a bunch of files and then I deleted some older files, but I still have space written out here, I really can't shrink the volume very well. But as long as I have blank space there, I can shrink my volume. And I just choose a size that I want to the amount to shrink. So this is the total size before shrinking, the size available to shrink it down, which means I only have a little bit of data written right here. And then choose the amount to shrink it. I'm going to shrink it by... I keep using my number pad and forgetting to turn on my number lock key. There we go, by 1,000 and click shrink and that will now shrink my volume and now you see instead of six i have seven gigabytes left over okay so that's easy enough we can create a volume we can shrink it we can uh, extend it on the same disk what about extending it to a different disk so i'm going to right click and choose extend volume again this time though i'm going to extend it to disk 2. So I'm going to click on disk 2 and add. And now I can select the amount of space that I want to extend it. Now notice that this doesn't always update for me right away. So here on disk 1, how much space do I want to add from disk 1 to it? How many, much space do I want to add from disk 2 to it? And I'm going to add 20 gigabytes from disk 2 and click next and finish. All right, that is going to require me to shift this disk. Now, you'll notice here these are basic disks. And as long as I'm doing something that's on one disk, basic is just fine. However, if I go to do something that crosses disks, I need to make them dynamic disks. And that's what this is telling me, saying you can't do this with basic disks. They need to be converted. However, don't worry, it'll convert it for us. Are you sure you want to continue? Say yes. And it's going to convert both of these to dynamic disks. And there we go. We now have a dynamic disk instead of a basic disk. Now I also want you to see what happened here. We now have an extended volume. Now this is still all E drive. Notice it is now not a primary partition. It is a spanned volume because it's crossing multiple disks. What that does is it will fill up this partition first. And because of the weird way it did it, It'll fill up this partition first, then it'll start writing to this partition, then it'll start writing to this partition. So I've got 50 gigabytes here, 20 gigabytes here, and if we look up at our... This hasn't updated yet. There we go little F5 to refresh it. If we look up at our simple volume here, now notice it is a spanned volume, it's dynamic, and it is 70 gigabytes. Now that is really cool because it allows us to take little pieces of available drives and put them together, or little pieces of available space on drives and put them together into 
one volume and use all of the space. Now because of the way it writes data, so it's going to write data across the first partition, then the second one, then the third one, because of the way it writes data, you don't get any performance boost. So it's not like using a striped volume, which will give you a performance boost, and it doesn't give you any redundancy. In fact, if any drive in the spanned volume collapses or fails, the entire volume collapses. So you actually run a big risk when you do that. Let me delete this volume, and let's take a look at a couple of other things. We'll come back to, to this in a little bit. Yeah, I want to go ahead and delete the volume. Since we were talking about redundancy, is there a way that we can create some redundancy? Yeah, actually we can. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to create a mirrored volume on disk 2 and disk 3. So I'm going to right click on disk 3. I'm going to create a new mirrored volume. And I'm going to click next. All right, and I want to mirror to disk 2. I'm going to choose Add and hit. Now, before I hit Next, notice that on disk 2, we have 41 gigabytes available. On disk 3, it's telling us it's only going to use 41 gigabytes. When we create a mirrored volume, it has to use the same amount. Let me just go ahead and click Next through the rest of these because we're doing the same thing. Let me just name this mirrored. It has to use the same amount. Ooh, almost forget to click Quick Format. of space on each drive. Now this is the same warning because one of the disks we chose was a basic disk. So we're going to say, yep, go for it. It's going to convert them to dynamic and it's going to use the same amount of space on both disks. And the reason it does that is because the way a mirrored volume works is it writes data to the first drive and everything that it writes to the first drive, it copies over to the second. So both of them are an exact mirror of each other. Now, notice a couple of things here. This is now red. Little legend down here says red is a mirrored volume. Okay, great. So, with that mirrored volume, it doesn't give us any performance increase, but it does give us redundancy. So if one drive fails, all of my data is still available on the other drive. But because of that, they have to have the exact same size, which means I've got 20 gigabytes of unallocated space here that I can't use. Well, I can use it. I can create a, another volume there, but it's only going to be 20 gigabytes unless I spanned it and joined it with disk 1. All right, so mirroring, mirrored gives us redundancy but not performance increase. So let's go ahead and delete that volume. A mirror always requires at least two drives. In fact, it requires only two drives. Now, let's try another one. Let's right-click on disk 1, and this time I want to create a striped volume. Now, a striped volume can use up to 32 disks. We're not going to use 32 disks. We're going to use three. Now, notice total volume size and then maximum available space. I'm going to click Next, and we're going to create this, and then we're going to talk about the striped volume. And perform a quick format, and this is going to be striped and go for it. All right, yes with the conversion. Converts everything to dynamic, works on striped volume, is gonna create another little legend down here for us with a different color, which identifies a striped volume. Now the way data is written to a striped volume is instead of writing across to fill disk one and then fill disk two, what it does is it writes data across all three. So it's going to write first piece of data, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. And so it's going to stripe the data across as many drives as you have in the stripe set. Now the great thing with that is this gives us a performance boost. Because if we go to write 10 megabytes of data, instead of writing all 10 megabytes of data to one volume, like we would here, or in a mirrored volume, write it to one volume and then copy it to the other. What it does is it writes a third of the data to each of the three disks. So my write times actually only take a third the time as if I was on a standard volume. Reads are the same way. Instead of reading all 10 gigabytes from one disk, I read three from here, well, three and a third, 
we'll say three for convenience sake, three, three, and three. So it takes me a third the time. And the more drives I have in the stripe set, the faster it runs. If I have 10 disks, then every read and write takes one tenth the time. That's the great thing about stripe sets. The bad thing about stripe sets is there is no redundancy. So if a single drive in the stripe set fails, everything collapses. Now, just so you are aware, um, a Stripe set with, and some versions of the operating system will support, they will support a RAID 5 or some older versions called it a Stripe set with parity. And it gives you the benefits of a Stripe set, but it adds parity information. And that's used for redundancy. So if a single drive fails, the entire thing doesn't collapse. If two drives fail, then it will. Okay, let's look at one more thing here. And notice, by the way, well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, I'm going to right-click a stripe set with parity or a RAID 5 requires at least three disks. Now, notice I've got 10 gigabytes here, 20 gigabytes here. So I've got little pieces of disks left over. And it's because the stripe set, since everything has to be the same size, it's limited by the smallest disk. So if I wanted to gather these two up, I could create a spanned volume. And in my spanned volume, I can include both of my drives. So 10 gigabytes from one drive, uh, 20 gigabytes from the other drive, and I can create a spanned volume that's going to include all 30 gigabytes here into one volume. There we go, spanned volume just came up. And so up here we can see the striped volume is 120 gigabytes, 40 from here, 40 from here, 40 from here. So it's 120 gigabytes. My uh, spanned volume here at F is running 30 gigabytes. Okay, so we've used it, or we've added disks, and then we've created some different types of volumes. Simple volumes, then we extended and we shrunk it. We've created mirrored volumes, we've created spanned volumes. Lots of different possibilities here. I do want to show you one more thing. Let's delete the span volume. Right click. RAID 5 is grayed out. We can't create a RAID 5 volume on Windows 10. It just doesn't work. We do have some other options available to us for redundancy if we use storage spaces. But in disk management, we no longer have those options. Now, one last thing, and that is everything that we have done here in disk management on the Windows client, you can do the exact same things in Windows Server. Windows Server disk management runs basically the same way as Windows 10 disk management. So it's... Everything you saw here, you can replicate over there when you add a new disk and you have all the same features. But one of the things we tend to do with servers, here we're doing all this with individual disks. With servers, especially higher end servers, we and not even really high end servers anymore, even a lot of our basic servers, we tend to do a lot of this with RAID controllers. So it's not managed by the Windows Disk Management System. Hardware RAID controllers actually give us a few more options. But workstations, and we use those in servers all the time, but workstations very rarely have those hardware RAID controllers. And you can get them. There are some available. You can use a hardware RAID controller. You can use a um, hardware RAID controller that you, uh, that you can buy for servers. Some of them will... Uh, work inside your PCs. There are also other lower end ones that are designed specifically for desktop computers and they'll work just fine. You can use those hardware RAID controllers but if you don't have that and you want to use multiple disks the easiest way to manage them is going to be using disk management in Windows 10.